welcome to the ICA. Thanks very much for your patience. My name is Sara Sasnelli, and I am the curator of Talks and Live here at the ICA. And tonight's conversation between artist and writer Sable Lee Smith and author Nicole R. Fleetwood will explore their respective research into the carceral, the personal, and the political. Both Nicole and Sable will present their work and then we'll come together for an in-conversation after. There will also be time for your questions and if you can just wait for the mic at that point, that would be great. Sable Lee Smith is an interdisciplinary artist, writer and educator based in New York and Richmond, Virginia. Using video, sculpture, photography and text, she points to the carceral, the personal, the political and the quotidian to speak about a violence that is largely unseen and potentially imperceptible. She's currently assistant professor of sculpture and extended media at the University of Richmond. Nicole R. Fleetwood is Professor of American Studies and Art History at Rutgers, New Br Brunswick. Her books are Making Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, On Racial Icons, Blackness and the Public Imagination, and Troubling Vision, Performance, Visuality and Blackness. She is co-editor of Aperture's magazine's Prison Nation, a special issue focusing on photography's role in documenting ma mass incarceration, and had curated numerous exhibitions and public programs on art and mass incarceration. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Nicole up to the stage. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. I'm a huge fan of Sable's work, and I've been in conversation with Sable for several years around um, carceral aesthetics. I also want to thank Sarah ICA, Carlos Ishikawa Gallery, JTT NYC, um, and everyone involved in making this happen. So what I'm going to do is just spend a few minutes kind of giving you some context for the work um, the research I've been doing for about nine years. Um, and Sable is actually in the book, my book, Marking Time, that's coming out in March of 2020. Um, as part of the work um, of the book and the research, I'm also curating a show that's gonna be opening in New York at PS1 um, in April and that will run through Labor Day and much of the art in the book will also be featured in the show. Um, so it, next, we're, we're having technical difficulties, so you'll hear me speaking to our tech support up above. So, you know, I start um, by all my talks by saying that this research comes out of my own family story of being hyper incarcerated. And um, I started after I finished my first book, whenever anyone asked me to come give a talk, I I didn't want to talk about a book that I had just published, which was Troubling Vision. Um, so I just started showing these images that were literally like in my like shoebox under my bed. And these are images um, of my incarcerated relatives and often trips that I would take back to Ohio where I grew up um, to visit them. So this is a picture of me posing with two of my cousins, DeAndre and Alan, who were incarcerated um, at the same time. Next. Um, here's a picture of uh, me with my cousin Alan. Alan went in at the age of 18, and he was sentenced to 15 years to life, and he was eventually released um, at the age of 39. So much of the um, work um, about, um, much of my photographs are actually just documenting our aging and documenting practices of belonging through the carceral state. This is Alan posing with his mother and me um, next. And then Alan with his daughter. His daughter was two months old when he went in, and she was 22 years old when he was released. Next. Um, and so one of the things I do when I'm looking at these photographs that are like you know vernacular portraits that are taken in US prisons is thinking also about how they circulate as these haptic objects um, among people, the loved ones of incarcerated people. This, and also the kind of emotional labor and often the economic labor involved in these images. So for example, Alan sent this out to all of the females in, his, in, in, in our family network. Um, on Valentine's Day, each image is like $2.50 when he's paid like 20, 20 cents an hour for his labor in prison. Next. So I like to start with that just to let you know like kind of my personal connection to this work and as I went around kind of lecturing different sites, art spaces, universities, libraries, more and more people would come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I have relatives who are in prison. People would give me part of their archives. And out of that, I've amassed this like large collection of art around um, um, imprisonment. Most of my book focuses on art made by currently and formerly incarcerated artists. And I put it in conversation with the work of 
artists like Sable and also artists like Maria Gaspar and Cameron Rowland and many non-incarcerated artists who are deeply impacted by the carceral state in the United States. Um, I open my book with um, this portrait, this self-portrait, and I really love this self-portrait by Ronnie Goodman, who um, was um, in prison in San Quentin for many years. Um, he's now out, he's unhoused, and he's involved in um, a movement in San Francisco around gentrification and um, the marginalization of people who are not able to afford um, the, the high rents. Um, but this self-portrait for him was very important because it's not only a document of himself as an artist, he's also doing curatorial work in, in the, um, the painting itself. So he said as he was painting himself, in, in the space of making art, he's also curating the work around him. For him, it's also really important to identify, you know, to kind of claim this marker and this tradition of artists in ateliers, artists in um, various forms of art institutions documenting themselves in, in this tradition of self-portraiture. Next. Um, so throughout the book, I look at these concepts, and uh, the concepts are carceral aesthetics, which I say is the production of art under the condition of unfreedom. And I think about artists who are in prison, but also artists like Sable who are not in prison, who are using various, various things, various kind of strategies to think about carceral aesthetics, to think about this long history of captivity, especially of marginalized people in the US. One artist that I focus on is Eddie Cates, who is currently in prison in New Jersey. He's been in for 30 years, and he started taking a drawing class when he was in his 60s. And what he does is he takes archival photographs of chain gangs and, and black subjugation, and he draws them on, on uh, he makes graphite drawings of them. Graphite drawings are the most common forms of art making in prison because you can do it on any documents. A lot of times incarcerated people will use the back of their own prison documents and a stub of a pencil to make these elaborate, exquisite drawings. Next. Um, another kind of theme that comes up around, um, around carcerality, around carceral aesthetics from inside prison is um, the long history of also of, 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 of forced reproduction. So Maria um, Elizabeth Enoch Baxter is also formerly incarcerated. You can access her work on YouTube. It's amazing. This um, Ain't I a Woman is a, um, is a, a video triptych that she made. She's also a spoken word artist. And it was about being shackled for 43 hours while she was giving birth in prison. And right after, um, she, she was then had to have a force. Um, she was, had to have an emergency C-section. She was shackled during surgery. Um, after she gave birth, she was thrown into solitary confinement for five days, and her child was removed from her. Um, she connects this, though, too, um, it's to slavery and, and the forced reproduction of enslaved women. Next. Um, and then James Hoff, who thinks a lot about, like, like an artist like Cameron Rowland, he thinks a lot about carceral economies um, and thinks about the um, kind of enduring and ongoing impoverishment of mo the most impacted communities by carceral economies. So James Hoff was sentenced to life without parole at the age of 17. And um, while in prison, he became this master artist where he started training other artists to become prison. They call him like the dean of art in, in this prison um, where he was housed for 27 years. And so here's one of his watercolors, I Am the Economy. Next. Um, and this is another watercolor uh, by him called How Big House Products Make Boxer Shorts. Big House Products is a for-profit company that operates in prisons in the state of Pennsylvania. And incarcerated people make boxers for about 15 cents an hour, and then they have to purchase those boxer shorts for $4 a pack. Next. Um, Tamika Cole is another formerly incarcerated artist who's working on some similar themes. She's out now, but when she was um, on in a kind of uh, a work release program, again, where she was like, it was around forced labor, um, she was doing these projects where she was creating the space that she wanted to occupy while in prison. And what she did was she um, would collect magazines and use, um, it was all collage based with graphite. And this is actually a small scale work. I think it's, um, I think it's nine by 12. Next. Um, so Gil, I, one of the things I'm interested in is how when incarcerated artists are released, how their works circulate more broadly in the art market. Gil Battle is an artist who's done quite well. He's a Filipino-American artist now based back in the Philippines. Um, and he draws, he um, etches these really elaborate scenes 
that partly from his experience of being in prison for 20 years, but also kind of a reimagining of law and order with this like critical twist on ostrich eggs using dental tools. Next. I think there's a couple of them. Next. Next. Um, so when I talk about carceral aesthetics, which I say is the production of art under the condition of unfreedom, I think about like the conditions that people make art in. And so one of the conditions is penal matter, and that's having very limited access to material goods to make art. So most incarcerated people confiscate material. They'll use like all kinds of state goods. Um, in the service of art, or of, of, of a kind of aesthetic freedom. And one of those artists is this uh, man named Dean Gillespie, who spent 20 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, and spent that time like creating all these relationships across difference. So he'd be, make friends with people of different races and ethnicities to collect materials to create these really elaborate miniatures. And so, for example, this is made out of like um, the foil from cigarette wrappers, what looks like the gravets that hold the dinette together, actually little sewing needles that someone confiscated and, and brought out in their underwear. Next. This is another one of his miniatures. Next. And this here is the inside of soda cans that he was able to actually turn inside out. Like what looks like windows are actually cause, um, the plastic from cassette tape. Uh, tapes that he was able to also manufacture um, in the production of art. Next. And then the inside is like all material that he was able to confiscate from various rooms in prison that could only happen through what I say is a relational practice of making friendships across differences in prison. Next. Um, and so I also think about like um, collaborative art practices that happen in spaces with like well-established artists. This is a, a series that was up at the Brooklyn Museum um, with a group of women at a prison in York, Connecticut. Um, it's called Shared Dining, and it was meant to be like directly in conversation with Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party. It was actually installed in the room right next to it. All the material for Shared Dining were uh, items that were readily available to the women in prison. Next. Um, and here you see, like, actually the kind of the kind of items that would be available to incarcerated women in a mess hall. Next, um, it's probably the one of the most elaborate works that I write about is Jesse Crime's Apocalyptine. Um, he was actually reading a lot of prison theory um, and, and political theory when he was in pr a federal prison in the U.S. He um, participated in this art collective and a prison studies group with other incarcerated people. Um, so this was based on his reading of like Dante and Agamben, and what he does is he creates these three tiers, like hell, heaven, and um, and earth, and he uses prison bed sheets. So this is 39 prison bed sheets. Um, I, it's 14 feet high and 40 feet wide. Um, he had no idea how the work would actually come together until he was released from prison. So he would he would make these elaborate um, image transfers using newspapers and also drawings, and then he would send the, um, the bed sheet out before it was confiscated by prison guards. Next. Since then, since his release, he's actually um, permanently installed Apocalyptin in um, the Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site, which is one of the oldest prisons in the U.S. It's now a museum, and so this is the permanent installation of it. Next. That's a detail. Next. Um, what he was also doing is working with, again, penal matter, materials available in prison. And these are prison bars of soaps. So he's using it, and he's transferring mug shots onto it. Um, and once he was released, he had like 292 of these image transfers. Each is elaborate and detailed and hard to transfer because he had no, like, nothing to like cut with. So he had to like fashion cutting device. Um, he had to use like toothpaste and hair gel as image uh, as a material for image transferring. Next. And th this is how he would actually sneak it out of prison. He'd wrap it in um, like this is a federal report about quote offenders. So he'd wrap them in prison uh, playing decks of cards and send them out to his family. Next. He was also working with another incarcerated artist, um, Gilberto Rivera. Again, I said they were like in this like really this like under common th like think tank where they're studying prisons, thinking about oppression, thinking about state repression. And Gilberto was identified as a quote gang member, and so whatever art he made would get confiscated. They would like raid it and think uh, for colors and the like. And so he got really pissed off at being like having all his art taken. So he takes his prison uniform 
uh, which is brown, and he turns it into this mixed media work. It also is about prison labor because his job was to mop floors, and so he uses like all his like mopping material and making this like three dimensional mixed media piece. Next. Um, and they also worked with this artist named Jared Owens. Jared wanted to become an abstract um, expressionist while in prison, which he said is an a, feat, a feat in itself because there was limited access to color palettes. So the, like, the chromatic schemes in prison is very subdued. So he was always trying to mix like brighter, brighter colors. Um, and orange was a really important color to him because orange was the color that demarcated a space that incarcerated people couldn't cross. Literally crossing into orange could get someone killed. And he says orange is still like his stress color, so he uses this as this kind of warning color in much of his work. And then blue was the color that, of the uniforms of, of the um, prison guards. Next. Um, this is one of Eric Jared's most wa more well-known pieces, been reproduced a few times and published. And this is called Elapsium, where he takes the iconic Brooks slave ship, which came out here in, in England in 1787. It was part of the abolitionist movement. Um, and he maps the federal prison where he was incarcerated on top, top of the Brooks slave ship, and he lines up the holding cells. Um, where you see all the kind of darkish spaces, he's actually mixed um, soil from his prison yard where he was incarcerated for 18 years into this. Next. That's another picture of it. Next. Um, and so the cover of my book is um, a series of portraits by an artist named Mark um, Lofney, and it's called Pyrrhic Defeat, and it's about like the idea of the, that like mass incarceration is supposed to be a victory, but it's actually this, it's a defeat. It's about the perpetuation of certain people who are, um, who, who are fueling all kinds of economies um, that are based on imprisonment. What Mark is currently in prison, and what he does is a performative project. He spends 20 minutes with currently incarcerated people, and he draws these um, sketches of them. At this point, he's amassed over 400 images, and this is an ongoing series, his effort to document mass incarceration from the space of captivity. Next. And this is a detail from it. Next. Um, and so I spent a lot of time talking about portraiture because it's a really common genre for incarcerated people, and they're often writing against their criminal indexes, like Russell Craig in this self-portrait where he actually he takes his prison ID card and turns it into this large-scale self-portrait. It's his first self-portrait. Next. This is another work by Russell Craig, thinking about the criminalization of black hair. Next. Um, and then um, James Hoff, who I said was sentenced to life without parole at the age of 17, um, he was able to take a workshop with Shepard Ferry, who visited his prison, and this was a, a self-portrait he made inspired by Shepard Ferry. So thinking about the kind of the collaborations and the kind of aesthetic practices that take place across the carceral archipelago. Next. Another self-portrait. Next. Next. Okay, so I'm going to end by talking about just, so I have an entire chapter that focuses on solitary confinement, where people have very limited access to any kind of resources, and they're often in isolation and, um, and, and are not in communication with other incarcerated artists. So Ajuri Latalo is one of these people who spent 22 years in solitary confinement not for crimes that he committed in prison, which is why most people go to solitary confinement, but because he was a radical, because he was part of the Black Liberation Army. So he was held away from, um, he was held um, separate from the general population. So all he has access to is his, uh, his prison records and his, like, his mugshot, his, um, uh, all, all of his um, appeals trying to get out of solitary confinement, and then anything he can find about political imprisonment and solitary confinement. And when he was released from prison in 2019, he had like literally hundreds of these collages that he had created, and he would send them out to um, advocacy groups to help get, um, gain awareness to um, the toll of solitary confinement. Next, I think this is the last one. Uh, yeah, and this is one of his final um, uh, collages before he was released. So I'm gonna pause right here, and, um, and then we're gonna bring up Sabor. Thank you. Okay, um, so to start, um, basically I'm gonna keep my talk a little bit short. Um, I'm gonna show a couple of images to kind of give us some context for the work so that me and um, Nicole can have sort of more time speaking. Um, but to start, I'm gonna show a video that's about eight and a half minutes titled Men Who Swallow Themselves in Mirrors. So 
Play video, please. Of course, they're not going to do it all. I've seen lots of people killed before, but I ain't never done it myself. I mean, I never had a reason to. Counting down our picks for the top ten hood films. Um. <laughs> um. <laughs> now my friend, he's driving the van. You know, he's looking at me at the corner of his eye, like, you know, saying, "What are you gonna say?" Whatever. So. Near the lakeside in Chicago was the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every ten seconds we will look from ten times farther away, and our field of view will be ten times wider. This square is ten meters wide, and in ten seconds the next square will be ten times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. It's funny the thing for you to see. So, you know, at about three and a half years old, she said, uh, she's riding in the van with us, and she said, uh, uh, 
uh, say that um, you don't like Daddy Mark, do you? And uh, <laughs> I kind of look like, you know, I wonder where this is coming from. So, so you know, like I said, I'm one of them parents think I'm going to tell my children the truth. I said, well, no, I don't. And she just looked at me and said, okay, that's fine. <laughs> so she was sitting in my lap. Of course, I was a hustler and I had a pistol in my waistband. Something that can make you do wrong. 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 sitting in my lap. Of course, I was a hustler and I had a pistol in my waistband. And when she sat back, she kind of bumped into it or felt it like whatever. And uh, she said, uh, uh, Daddy, what's that? <laughs> now my friend, he's driving the van. You know, he's looking at me at the corner of his eye like, you know, saying, what are you going to say? Whatever. So, you know, again, uh, I'm going to tell my children the truth. I said, it's a gun. And she said, oh, okay. So she thought about it, and she said, well, why do you have a gun? <laughs> and my friend looked at me again at the corner of his eye like, I know what you're going to tell her now, big shot. So he didn't say nothing, but he just kind of like glanced at me at the corner of his eye. So I said, um, I told uh, Eve I was a very, very important man. Slideshow. <laughs> PowerPoint. Next. Okay, beautiful. Um, okay, so like I said, I'm going to kind of um, just like cycle through a couple of uh, more recent works. Um, so next, please. So what is in focus is the body. Next, the viewer's body, my body. The bodies of those cataloged away and choreographed by others in structures. Next. Next. Um, where work might be located in the body. Where the impetus for the vibration of a scream comes from. Next. 
how that scream might be deafening, how the body is pried apart when the scream is deafening and where pain lives, where memory lives, lies, and all the ways the body triggers from its own remembering and re-rendering. Next. Where are you touched? What touches you? Next. The trace, the oil residue, the mark, the scar, the wound, the path of a tear tracing a winding path down a cheek. The mark of my hand on suede. Mine is a practice primarily concerned with touch. Next. Often these works um, act out the things touching you. Next. The things foreclosing imagination, like coloring book pages children can't seem to climb out of. Next. Instead, they're told, make home here. In these boundaries, draw your own pictures. Thanks for visiting. Next. As if they made a choice. As if dragons don't belong in a courtroom, but five-year-olds do. Next. Um, I'm surfacing the trickery. You can press play. I'm surfacing the trickery of memory, of narrative, of language, of syntax, of the utterly sinister way that our world pushes down on us, stomachs to pavement searching for breath. Some of the works individually point to a quietude, an invisibility, but carefully and in concert with one another, like a slow uprising, these works form a cacophonous symphony, swelling, vibrating, lingering. Okay, thank you. Sable and I are going to talk for about 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, and when we open it up to the audience, we just ask that you wait for the microphone to come to you. I, you know, I, I just told Sable off stage. I said, you know what? I, I'd like to begin by asking Sable um, to just talk about. I've known you since 2014. Um, your earliest kind of iterations, your earliest explorations of these of things around carcerality, the fragmentation of memory. I know you're not interested in any kind of fidelity to memory, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know the structures of violence that just like continue to kind of animate black lived ex experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a good question and a hard question also because my memory is bad. Um, but no, so I would say, um, I guess. Growing up, I've always had this kind of like um, maybe fantastical kind of like fam fantastical and kind of like uh, memoir esque writing practice um, that was very much sort of about fragments and kind of like under these like quick stream of consciousness kind of like writing. So I would say like structurally, maybe that is the first place where it sort of began. And I can say maybe like uh, specifically like high school, but maybe towards the end of middle school, and then like. Um, the the like very specific sort of pointed work um, also dealing with the subject matter of incarceration began like in college um, and beginning creative writing courses first and then I started um, just sort of having access to videography and like uh, video sort of editing um, um, software and sort of materials um, and those were the first works that I've ever started making like they always kind of like came from this um, like I guess a sort of personal space first. And text is always a part of your work, uh, right? I mean, it's there's this relationship between visuality and textuality and embodiment. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, like, for text and writing, right, like, it has always been probably, like, the, the foundation kind of core of my practice because it also is the most accessible form that sort of I had access to, right? Like, I could always find a pen and paper. Um, I didn't always have like a sort of structured art course or like um, even understanding of sort of what materiality might be. So I was always writing and that was something that was sort of natural. Um, and language is sort of became the way that I also started to sort of process things visually. Um, so like even with a video piece, like I think statistically it's probably a lie, but we'll say 80% of the things that I make like start from some some sort of fragment of a thing that I've read or um, a text by another artist and that sort of suggests either a color or a texture and then from there maybe some sort of object is birthed. Does, so word, do words still kind of come first? Like, yeah, do you, yeah like I, think, a, oh. I think absolutely, yeah. Um, it's words or sort of an affect and then like I am thinking about poetic language to poetic language and probably like um, the kind of like structural cadence of music to then figure out some other form to sort of translate it into. Like all the work is these sort of multiple acts of translation. And, and sound is so central to 
especially your your video your time based works, mm -hmm. and I've seen also some of the collaborative work you've done, like the the project um, Mirror Echo, Echo Tilt that mm -hmm. was up at the New Museum, and I know that you were like you said you were really like. The sound quality of that was very important to you, and, and so what is happening to you? What's that relationship you have? And I know it's partly vibrational because mm -hmm. sound happens in the body, and mm -hmm. often we forget about the experience of sound through the body. Mm -hmm. But you talk about the vibrationality of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say like um, one, just like music has always been like a, a, again another sort of foundational kind of like reference um, because of uh, the kind of like um, emotion, like the viscerality of emotion. Um, that can be immediately kind of like turned on and also like uh, maybe mm, like switch gears, right, with music. Um, but also because like, so I've always been thinking about and sort of interested in talking about violence and talking about these sort of larger structures, uh, structures of violence, um, but not at the sort of distancing level of like theory or sort of talking or trying to uh, articulate the, the whole system, right? Like I've always been interested in like how it sort of affects the body and in a one-to-one one way and also those things that are like hyper invisible that like one might struggle to kind of like label or identify as being violent right like even if you sort of experience something yourself there might be a kind of like tension between trying to understand or sort of reconcile what's happening um, and so thinking about sound right thinking about um, something that is uh, sort of technically or sort of perceived as intangible um, and thinking about the kind of like distance between silence, the vibration, the sort of loud deafening sound and something that is sort of melodic and seductive but also can like sort of stay with the body and something that you can't actually, um, you can't kind of like not feel it, right? Like if you're in a room and there's a, subwoof, a subwoofer there, right? Like that's, that's something that is touching you whether you sort of recognize it or not. Um, and there are all these ways that like, I mean, like if you're even thinking about uh, fluorescent lights or sort of uh, neons, right? Like these sort of buzzes, right? And, you, and, and they become uh, um, uh, perceptible to you when you sort of leave the room or when it's sort of absent. And so just using <coughs> and thinking about those subtleties and structures that begin to point to other things that, other sort of systems around us that are in our life that are invisible in that way, but that are actually sort of touching us and like can be located in the body. As you say that, um, I was thinking about that this, you know, where you go back to your father telling the story about having the pistol, mm -hmm. and and it, we can say it's a scene of violence, but it's also this scene of love, like the you or the the, the young person is on the lap, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's also a kind of attunement to the fact that your father or the, the character doesn't like someone, right? Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. all these kind mm -hmm. this kind of tenderness that's also wrapped up in all the this story, these stories that are happening. Yeah. But you re, you go back to it, and repetition is so central to your work, right? Like you, you talk about fragmentation, and you you've said to me a couple of times you don't have a good memory, but you repetition is so important in your work. And mm -hmm. what's happened? And, and of course, that's partly like something happening on a psychic level. But I'm just wondering how that plays out for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that like for uh, there's like a uh, yeah. There's a number of ways that uh, I think, or there's a number, a number of sort of um, kind of uh, images that repetition sort of stands in for. So one is like to think about the the sort of uh, self-replicating like system of mass incarceration, right? So like um, for the series of coloring books, right? Like the 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 base image is rep um, is repeated. Um, and the sort of painting or uh, the marks that are made change, right? But this is to sort of actually try to begin to point to like the number of bodies that this object touches and then by default that this sort of um, system touches, right? Um, so that's one way that sort of repetition um, functions. Um, but then it also sort of thinks about, um, especially in the time-based works, right? Like this sort of cycle of time um, that one potentially is stuck in and each time maybe like, um, how a thing is repeated, something has changed a little bit more, and then um, you, as the viewer, may maybe sort of become um, a little bit more sort of hypersensitive to this sort of act of looking or, or searching for something um, or sort of being affected by something just like a little bit sort of tighter. That's wonderful, and because the repetition is happening now in this, your kind of current ser series with like the, the prison... Um, the, the cafeteria, sculptures. Yeah, yeah, the sculpture. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's using what I say is called penal matter, right? You're, like you're using all this kind of material that's structures, carcerality, and also the kind of food packages and stuff like that. Yeah. So, can you? How did you get into that work? And and just accessing that, right? As you like, how has your kind of practice changed as you've accessed different kinds of materials? 
Yeah, yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think for me, um, the like the site of the prison visiting room has always been like this, uh, I guess, kind of like reference image that I've gone back to multiple times um, because one, like it's a space where uh, sort of incarcerated and non-incarcerated people have uh, more of an opportunity to actually mingle, right? Like it's supposed to be a space where intimacy can happen. It's supposed to be a space where love can happen. It's a, it's a space where one is sort of reminded of something other than uh, the actual sort of space of the prison and what the daily life looks like there. And it's technically supposed to be a space of, um, what is the word, rehabilitation. Um, but none of those things happen there. Um, and so for me, right, like there are, m there are multiple ways um, and types of sort of uh, oppressive sort of practices that happen within the prison space. Um, but it is especially fascinating to think about uh, the space where one's family members and friends um, and the sort of incarcerated person kind of like mingle and that to be a space that's sort of hyper surveilled um, and like where these sort of subtle um, acts of sort of brutality happen, um, especially because it is a space of intimacy and it is a space of touch, right? And so for me, it became really interesting to focus on the, 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 the tables in the visiting room because that's sort of the space where you're kind of like stationed for the four sort of six hour visit. Um, and this is the one space where touch is present, but there are so many ways where um, that is sort of uh, regulated by the actual sort of furniture um, and sort of surveillance and kind of like a, a harshness and a hardness is actually sort of built into the sort of design of it. And you also talk about like gender regulation in those spaces, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like the surveilling of especially women and girls' bodies going mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. the visiting mm -hmm. room and um, and how that structured your sense of embodiment over a, a period of time of visiting your father. Can you talk more about just like how gender, like kind of um, gender formation, you know, through that kind, through those carceral structures, mm -hmm. even when you might not be the person actually held in captivity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think also like those things kind of like play out subtly just because there's so many ways that like, um, I guess the, the the sort of balance and the difference between sort of uh, like uh, agency and sort of power being executed executed in those spaces come through the sort of regulation of clothing and also like the the idea of like so I mentioned the prison visiting room being the space of touch but also before you even sort of are able to access that space right like the correctional officers are touching your body. Um, and telling you yeah, your clothes yeah, are tell, yeah, appropriate you or not appropriate. inappropriate, but right. there's like these kind of like, uh, there's these moments where I think that there's this kind of like risk of like taking liberties, right? Like I have the access to kind of like touch you um, and you have to go through this because like, I don't know, typically people are driving like, I don't know, anywhere from two to like four hours and spending the whole day and spending money to try to access. And so you have no agency, you have no repercussions, right? If something um, sort of inappropriate or just like demeaning happens. And that is like the sort of first, that's basically what sort of primes you for then the hyper surveilled space. And then like um, trying to kind of create a moment of normalcy when you're able to sort of access the person that you come to visit. And just for some context, for those of you not familiar with US prisons, like there's lawsuits of women and who are visiting loved ones in prison, and they they're forced to have like body uh, like their like cavity search searches. like uh, yeah cav cavity searches as part of like getting into a prison to see their boyfriend or father yeah. when there already is an X-ray machine right right so I mean it's a really it's uh, it's you're of, often assaulted through the process of trying to uh, to visit incarcerated relatives um, so how but can you say more about how gender plays out in terms of like even that the kind of exchanges between you and your father mm, I don't know maybe um, can you rephrase the question yeah I can rephrase it so uh, your father addressing you not as an adult and often talking about memories of you as a child mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. you as this kind of you know working mm -hmm. artist you know and there seems to be like um, you know, a space where he's held in captivity with a lot of other black men mm -hmm. and the kind of mobility of you as this artist mm -hmm. moving fluidly through these spaces. Mm -hmm. Maybe frame, maybe if I frame it around you, the, the way that your father has been framed as often your muse, which is mm -hmm. often a very feminized term, mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. but he's also been um, written about as like your collaborator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also someone who could be a critic uh, mm -hmm. who's watching the work that mm -hmm. you're making. Mm -hmm. It seems that gender kind of underpins many of those exchanges as much as race and other kind of. Yeah, I uh -huh. mean, I think, I think definitely maybe, um, 
right? Like, um, in especially like a lot of the video work, right? Like there, there are moments that, uh, like it is about maybe my sort of specific, uh, sort of narrative, right? And like, um, bits of, um, sort of my father's narrative, but also these are kind of like, uh, stand-ins or they kind of like slip in between a kind of like cultural construction of black masculinity, um, especially like, um, like uh, the majority of um, the footage that I sort of uh, uh, source are from these kind of like I mean in this video right like you hear you hear the you hear the yeah you hear the woman say like counting down the top ten hood films right so there are these kind of like Hollywood um, kind of like caricatures and stereotypes of like urban um, like urban sort of cinema or sort of gangster flicks right um, and so I think that in um, the way that I'm sort of thinking about syntax and kind of like filmmaking, right? Like all of those things um, are sort of presented and then kind of like slowly pried apart um, and become like a little bit more slippery. And maybe that's where um, I guess you sort of mentioned is kind of like play between like maybe tenderness and violence happens, right? Which maybe sort of seduce the, the, the sort of hyper masculine image a little bit. But I think that um, something that I'm sort of in interested in is like also the kind of like uh, sensuality, right, um, of the the material of the video, um, and that being this layer that's also placed on top of like these m um, multi sort of layers of the uh, narrative or the kind of like stereotype of like um, uh, black criminality, aka black masculinity. And I, I also feel that that happens when your father kind of references you as child and mm -hmm. through memories, and then as a kind of working artist, mm -hmm. you know, in terms mm -hmm. of like doing the work, mm -hmm. right? So that there's kind of like um, these multi-references that are happening to you. And I feel like there, the kind of tone or rationality around it changes mm -hmm, as mm -hmm, he's, mm -hmm. you know, and again, memory. Right, well, it's like, it's, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that the, 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 the videos specifically, like they are given permission to be fluid mm -hmm, and they're mm -hmm. given permission to sort of slip back and forth into it, like, into like these different sort of performances of identity. Right, right. Yeah. So I think, so are we ready for yeah, the cool. crowd? Okay. So questions from the audience, comments? And while you're priming your questions, I want to just be able to like actually say about Sable's show that's opening on Thursday, right, um, at Carlos Ishikawa Gallery in East London, and it runs through the 19th of December. So just have that on your radar. Um, hi. Um, I wanted to ask Sable if you could talk more about your use on blue and maybe if you think about the blues when blue, you're making. you said? Yeah, blue, blue yeah. and then blues music. Yeah, yeah. That. yeah no, absolutely. Um, like, blue f is uh, a kind of like constant and ongoing uh, motif um, that shows up in probably all of the series I would say I'm like trying to think through um and like I I'm interested in the blue for like a number of reasons and they all kind of like like rhyme with each other so one definitely like the blues music which is like also um uh like I, I'm interested in like popular music forms that I kind of like strip apart and remix and sort of cut back together in a lot of the video work so like the the idea of the blues and this kind of like uh the narrative of it uh the kind of like sound the sorrow the sort of wailing and sort of whining of a guitar um and like thinking about that as like this other kind of like in like the the way that the sort of uh like the, the what do you call it the string of a guitar sort of vibrates right um and like if we're watching this video when it's sort of installed that same vibration happens from the low bass that's in it right so there's a way that that's sort of replicated um and uh, like a part of the invisible uh structure and then like um there are other moments where you see the blue sort of going back and forth because it's the the sort of um the color of the prison uniforms and that's in that sort of photographic collage series and then thinking about like prison or uh, police blues, uh, the blue sky. Um, there are other um, sort of um, other kind of like references that play out across, um, I guess, the practice, which is like also a thing that's kind of interesting to me, right? Like there could be a one-off work or like a series, um, but the thing that's sort of most exciting is kind of like the narrative or the sort of resonance that happens between projects, and you kind of see like the the story of this blue, so to speak, um, kind of like bounce between those things. Um, so yeah. Um, 
I was just curious, Nicole, but you kind of talked about, um, like, I, I feel like you were talking about, like, the, the, the ma like, material reality of making work for, like, incarcerated people or something, but you mentioned that you kind of, in the book, get to, like, Sable's work and, like, the work of people that haven't been incarcerated specifically or whatever, and so I just was curious, like, w what that, I don't know, like, what, yeah, sorry, just if you could speak more to, like, how that work comes into the book or sure, something. Sure, sure, and so and it, I started, and I didn't actually fin like finish what I was going to say around it, is that I look at, like, in, ter in terms of thinking about carceral aesthetics, I look at penal matter, space and time. Mm -hmm. So I look at, for people in prison, I look at, like, the space of captivity and, and how they use that for the production of art. Um, time as punishment, right? And, like, to experience time as punishment and then to turn that into another kind of use of that time. And then the limited access of material or the use of um, the site of prison as, as like, the kind of base of material practice. And so a lot of what Sable's doing is also using material, the ephemera, but also the kind of the material world of carcerality and this kind of exploration, a very kind of formalist exploration that she's having of structures of violence. And Cameron Rowland is someone else I look at in terms of his thinking about like um, asset forfeiture and the kind of continued impoverishment of, of, of poor, pe poor black people and incarcerated people or um, um, prison labor. Titus Kafar, who uses his um, um, used criminal indexes as a type of penal matter to make art. So those are some of the um, aesthetic currents that I try to make across um, states of captivity or, or quote, freedom. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, both of your presentations. Uh, Nicole, I had a question for you. Um, Mary Elizabeth Enoch Baxter's work really stuck out to me in your presentation, not only because she, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, she was the only woman in your presentation? No? no? no I'm sorry. Nicole, there are others too. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's totally fine. But, but also, <laughs> she was the only one who didn't use drawing or sculpture as a medium, is that right? So she was using it, she made a video after release, and it's a video that I think is really interesting to have in conversation with Sable's work specifically, mm -hmm. because she she is making work about a woman giving birth to a son who th is then taken from her, so you know, and, and thinking about like, the whole video is about like how, um, you know, captivity is not gonna break the, the kind of belonging and, and sense of relationship that she's forging with her with her um, her son, and she's playing with time also in it. So it's a triptych because she kind of plays with her life before prison, during prison, and after prison. And so in many ways, it, it's, it's, it, structurally it looks different, but it's similar issues are coming up. Well, my question was very, very broad in general, and I was just wondering uh, if you uh, could comment, both of you, if you could comment on it. Um, I just, I, I, I wonder, um, considering the amount of w women versus the amount of men that are incarcerated. Um, and I haven't seen any of their work expressed as Mary Elizabeth's, Mary, sorry, what was her name? Yeah, it's okay, Mary Elizabeth Enoch Baxter. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, could you talk a little bit more about um, women in prison and what might be their forms of <coughs> expression, artistic or... So the shared dining series I showed also were by yeah. by women. So there, um, you know, I get I I get this question a lot when I just do presentations, and I like I tell people like ninety two percent of the people in prison have been labeled men, whether they identify as men is another thing. So like one, we have to think about like to me, this is a feminist abolitionist project I do, but to me, for it to be a feminist project doesn't mean I have to show fifty percent of work by women. Who are, I mean, given like how. Uh, incar incarceration structures gender relations. And so I, w the way that I deal with the, its impact on women is often by thinking about who's sustaining those relationships with incarcerated men, how those relationships get um, sustained, and then who's also doing kind of work around incarceration that often engages broader publics and not just about um, often solo artist practice. Because Sable also does has done, been involved in a lot of collaborative work that's think and also work with the directly impacted populations. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would say the other thing, specifically for like a US context, right? Like um, part of, I guess 
part of the reason that I've sort of been interested in like uh, making a sort of majority of the practice sort of focused on this subject and doing other pedagogical work about it, right, is because um, the narrative is um, focusing on men and it is obviously like uh, there are sort of huge numbers of men who are incarcerated, right? But like, if we're thinking about statistics and we're thinking about the way something is framed and like, um, we're sort of perpetually caught in the kind of like trap of not addressing everything, right? And so the more narratives, the more sort of visibility, the more spaces that other people sort of have to participate, then like there, there becomes sort of more narratives that are sort of at play, right? And then you have to kind of like, uh, I guess, deal with that. Um, but right now the sort of dominant narrative is focusing on like the sort of number of men, right? But that doesn't mean that there aren't other sort of artists, other sort of art groups, uh, educational sort of programs, diversion programs that um, are focusing on uh, uh, women incarceration. Or children, or yeah. like, or, yeah. or, even, or even a lot of incarcerated men, I, I, I write about, they're doing collaborations <laughs> that are across, like with women who are not in prison or like doing programs. So, there, it's, so I think that... Um, it's it's more capacious than than just like either or, and most of the teachers or most of the teaching artists that I write about are in are women who are not incarcerated who are working with incarcerated men. So I'm looking at the collaborations that happen between teaching artists who are often in feminized positions working for nonprofits and hyper incarcerated Black and Latino men. Um, firstly, thank you to, um, for two incredible presentations. Um, Nicole, I was wondering, um, one thing that stood out to me in that talk was um, that a lot of, art, of the artists in your book have had their um, work confiscated in prisons. And I was wondering how sort of many prisons in America encourage the arts as like a, a practice in the... Um, in the prisons, and is there funding for art specifically? Because I know you mentioned as well that Shepard Ferry went into one of the prisons. It's a really good question, and it um, prisons are li like little uh, fiefdoms, so each operates differently. And there are prisons where um, the warden and the whole administration benefits from art made by incarcerated, like they sell that work. Like Angola, which is the large in Louisiana, which is on a former slave plantation, it's the largest maximum security prison in the world, with over six thousand people incarcerated there. And twice a year, they do this this quote rodeo, an art show, and they make millions of dollars. Um, and also, many of the organizations that work with incarcerated people um, see their work as like partly managing prison population, so that people are like so. There's no riots, right? So it's in some ways it's a kind of disciplinary tool. Um, and then there's spaces where people are making like you know radical political art that is getting them thrown in solitary confinement. So there's a whole range of things that are happening, and all art making is not like quote you know like somehow uh, and you know critiquing um, the prison state. You know, but I'm looking at a lot of practices that are happening um, that are not endorsed by prison administration, and that actually violates certain codes, like racial segregation, which most prisons uphold. And I also had a question for Sable. Um, I read somewhere online that um, in your court case series that you found a book um, of uh, the, the court in somewhere on the street, and you've been taking it around and using it wherever you go since. Um, and one thing that stood out to you was how it, it was um, trying to take something like the court and law and make it seem so normal to children. I was wondering if you could talk about this uh, a bit more. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, the coloring. Um, so I found this coloring book, uh, I guess 2015 now. Um, and this was like completely serendipitous. Um, like I knew there's sort of um, objects like this existed, but um, I was literally sort of taking a stroll in Harlem on 125th Street. Um, there was a discarded coloring book on the ground that had been colored by a child, and somehow I was like um, kind of compelled to pick it up. Um, and I started looking at this object, um, and there was like one page that sort of struck me as being um, completely terrifying. Um, and basically the sort of scene is a court waiting room 
um, and there are 10 sort of people. So there's like these um, kind of like clusters of like uh, children and a parent and like a lone child. And there's a um, uh, chef with a three layered cake um, and a police officer. And then there are 10 kind of like fantastical objects. So there's a butterfly, there's a dragon, um, there's some sort of shale. Um, there's grapes, um, an alligator, and a teacup, a teapot, teapot actually. Um, and so then there's like on the bottom because it's like a coloring book plus an activity book. So there's this little uh, narrative that talks about like, oh, it's like really hard to wait. We're waiting. Like waiting is bad. Ooh, like boring. Um, and then there's one um, question at the end, right, that um, is the sort of activity or the prompt for the child to participate in. It says, what 10 things don't belong here? Right, so there's there's equal ten people and then ten fantastical objects, um, and so I started thinking about this 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 page for a while because also like um, um, I guess for as long as I've also been making art, I've been working in education in different capacities, um, so museum education, et cetera, et cetera, always in some sort of art context, and so I'm also thinking about who the audience is, early childhood developing uh, development, like the the structure of the question and also the language, the vocabulary that's used in a question. Um, and basically what it's asking the child to do is sort of X out things that constitute their imagination, right? And so their aspiration. And then at, at each, on that page specifically, but then at each page that you sort of turn throughout the book, uh, it sort of reifies and, re and, and um, substantiates the fact that the people belong in the space, right? And so like, yeah, maybe sometimes people gotta go to court, but that doesn't mean that they belong there. Right, so the, the, this is the thing that I, the, this was sort of the close looking, right? And also this, this specific coloring book that I found was made by a nonprofit organization that thinks that like that is well intentioned, right? And so even it being well intentioned um, is a serious sort of problem, right? Thank to you. me it is. We have time for a couple more questions. There's a hand in the back. Hey, thank you guys for coming out here. Um, I guess I'm just really sort of interested in the, and just kind of like what you were talking about, these these things that are made with a good intention, but maybe run as, astray of what they're trying to do. And I really noticed uh, the scenes from Don't Be a Menace mm -hmm. to South Central. And I guess my question is for both of you, of just like sort of movies like that and, and media like that, is that, is that something that needs to sort of be recontextualized as we move forward for mm -hmm. us to, to, to gain the benefit from them? Or just should, should we sort of remove that and try to rebuild uh, our own sort of canon of what incarceration looks like from both sides? I said, you're the media expert. Yeah, well, I, I actually, I, I chose not to write about any film or TV in my book. Uh, so, like, I was, because we're saturated with these, like, what um, scholar Michelle Brown calls penal spectatorship, where, where you, it just, it normalizes, like you were saying, who belongs in what spaces and how those spaces function. Um, and so I chose to, I was not interested in that kind of, that, 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 kind of, that type of receptional practice. Um, but you actually, like, turn things upside down. I mean, you're, you, you like to abstract, right? You like to take kind of these normative narratives and, and kind of abstract certain things and, and play with form so that we are compelled to create new narratives or to new fantasies around it. Yeah, um, I mean, um, to your question, right, like, uh, there, there's sort of a spectrum on the type of media that's produced, who's producing the media, who's funding the media, the, like those, the, if we're talking about movies specifically, like who's funding the movies, like who wrote the movies, right? Like, so that was Menace to Society, uh, different context. Like, I think that there, there's, there's, there's a necessity for a, a number of types of sort of voices, narratives, and things to be shown and seen, right? And so you mentioned recontextualization, which like, does happen, right? Like there are people who are writing about these films. There's like my interest in um, a kind of like popular cultural kind of like canon or archive is because it is also a kind of like reference that um, the people I'm interested in um, sort of having more conversations with and actually seeing and accessing my work. Like these are shared references. Like this is also my archive. Like I've seen this movie. I've watched the movie tons of times, right? Like I listen to Al Green a lot, right? Um, so, like, uh, there are also, like, um, 
uh, layered in there, maybe like art historical references, but those aren't the things that are sort of privileged and at the forefront. So there's a different type of, or I guess there's like, there's like, um, sometimes I sort of describe my practice as being like, you know, I don't know, bilingual or sort of multilingual, right? Like there's a vernacular, there's a kind of like uh, maybe a theoretical, then there's an art theory, then there might be a film theory, then there's like this kind of like space of, um, 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 I don't know, like slang and small talk and like uh, thinking about different types of experiences that are all sort of on the same equal playing field to think about and can contextualize the work differently, right? Like it's not a, a critical essay say about Minister Society, but somebody who's seen Minister Society might see this and think something slightly different or just like look closer, right? Um, and then consider what that image does for them, how it can be um, a kind of like tool that is about recognition, but then also a kind of like hint that someone can move further or um, sort of, I don't know, yeah, further away from it. Thank you. Um, Nicole, you'd mentioned um, during your presentation just that amongst a lot of the work that you'd seen, there was a fairly strong emphasis on portraiture uh, as well, and I, which I, I suppose makes a lot of sense, I think, in a system where uh, obviously control over your own image um, is something that, that gets lost uh, very quickly, and even before incarceration, that's, that's a big part of it. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about, uh, you know, the, the, the role of um, portraiture as a, as a kind of art form within the, the work and also maybe the um, sort of recontextualization of mugshots um, in some of those um, pieces as well, where, which is obviously in a way like the, the form that, that one has like the least control over and where you're kind of um, prescribed into a very particular narrative of criminality that, that's very much beyond the control of the, the person in question. Yeah, and portraiture serves a lot of functions in prisons, and one is it's a currency. So um, portrait artists are like some of like have more power than most incarcerated people. They're commissioned, they make money, and they often make very good money, or they're bartering, you know, trading portraits for like coffee or cigarettes or things like of that sort. Um, it's also um, a genre that allows people to kind of cross racial and ethnic affiliation. So you always hire the best portrait artist, no matter like what how they affiliate or identify. Um, and so in that way, it also creates various types of communities. Um, and I, the most common portraits are either of incarcerated people or family and loved ones. So people often will take a photograph of their child and say, can you draw or paint or blah, blah, blah. So it's also these practices of belonging and like um, ways of you know sending um, gifts home and the like. So it has all these functions. Um, but most people who've written about art in prison will comment on, on, on portraiture because it's just so, so popular. Um, and artists will say that they're actively writing, you know, kind of working against the state, kind of state representations of them. And at the very back, there's a hand up. Uh, thank you for for your time here. Um, and my question is to Sable. Um, if I understood correctly, uh, um, Often in your practice, the text is a kind of uh, first thing, and uh, then y you translate it into a, a visual uh, form. Um, if you if you can elaborate on, on this a little bit more, I, I, do you apply a certain kind of methodology to it, or because you resort in, uh, I assume you, you probably use um, this kind of process in uh, different works that uh, where the text is, is an, an initial kind of thing. Uh, yeah, thank you. Is there a method at this point? No, yeah. It, um, hmm. I'm like, maybe in my head there's some kind of like methodology. There's like an idiosyncratic like, I don't know, rhyme and reason to it. But um, I guess I would say that like, um, it's sort of not, it's not strictly like, here is a sort of uh, text that I've written or here's a, uh, a type of text that I'm interested in and then like we like I translated to like kind of like one-to-one -one, like an object I think um, the thing that is probably prevalent in the practice right is because like 
one, I'm interested in thinking about uh, sort of uh, these kind of like um, violent sort of structures and like systems of oppression or sort of systems of violence, right? And our language is a system that also is kind of like operating in these kind of like invisible ways too. So I'm always kind of like interested in thinking about uh, language as sort of a, a system and a symbol and like thinking about syntax and kind of like breaking structures. Um, and so sometimes I kind of like apply that logic to um, an object that I'm making or I think about like juxtaposition of sort of two like objects, right? And like how um, that might mimic a kind of like linguistic syntax. Um, and then other times because I'm like um, mainly kind of like interested in a, in, a, in a poetic language when I'm sort of writing things or thinking about um, or, or, or I guess kind of like inspired by things. It's like that, that language that sort of creates an affect or a texture or a tone. Um, and so it's either that tone or that texture that then sort of inspires like, okay, the root of this video is gonna be, I don't know, watching these guys sort of shoot the ice because there's something like linguistically there that makes sense to me. So I think we're, Jasmine, you, <laughs> you have the final question. <laughs> okay, Jasmine has Giggling. the final. <laughs> Is that working? Oh my no. God. <laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> well, I just know both of you, and I know that. Um, well, I know Sable obviously. Jasmine <laughs> represents <laughs> Sable at JTT NYC. But I well, something that's so unique to working with Sable is that she works not only as an artist but as a social worker, as an educator, in all these different capacities. So I get a chance to see a little bit of how you integrate all these different worlds. Um, but my question is for both of you, and especially Nicole, in anticipating your show next spring. You're going to be bringing together like two very different art, art communities. Um, and also, I would assume a, a little bit of a social practice in, in doing that. Do you have a hope for how bringing together like an art community and like a, a another community maybe focused more on social justice can actually work together to undo some of these things you guys are clearly like looking so carefully at? So I'm not sure if you, everyone heard Jasmine's question. It's about the show that I'm I'm doing in April around the book and about bringing various communities together, especially in museum spaces, like people who are like in established art institutions and markets with people who might be making art through other networks, right? That are where they're not represented um, by galleries, and then also people who might be really committed to like more social practice work. Um, and so for me, I'm, what I'm really interested is interested in is like thinking for us to think really broadly around how carcerality or structures of violence and state repression shape culture. Um, and often we only look at culture through specific lenses and those are lenses that get legitimated or popular culture, like things that are easy to access. Um, and so also thinking about how people from various states of freedom and freedom are using material access, right? And using resources and using networks to experiment. And for me, there's something that like is kind of um, not not Pollyanna, but is a bit aspirational, and, it, and it's about art making under any conditions, too, right? Like that, you know, I write about people who are like, I write about an artist who made a self-portrait before he committed suicide in solitary confinement. I mean, he was like trying to, he, he was using art to like keep him going for as long as he could, right? Um, so thinking, I mean, I think that's what, what really underlines this project. It's really like this, like the power of art making under like, extreme systems of brutality under, or, you know, how material access might change your platform, right? You were writing at one time because you, that, you were limited with maybe material access and also your ability to manipulate mm -hmm. and, and experiment, right? So, so it is kind of an also exploration of that under carcerality, under this current system that we've created where, you know, prisons are everywhere. Does that? <laughs> okay. So thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Um, thank you. It was a great turnout. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone at ICA. Carlos, Ishikawa, JTT, NYC. Sable's mom, who is here in the audience. <laughs> Sable's like, I'm going to...